going to pick up right where we left off. And we did some fancy geometric footwork. And we proved this limit. Do you remember this limit? One. What did we, um, what did we find? And we said it was one, right? Which means that one is a special number because it is its own reciprocal. So not only is this limit equal to one, but the reciprocal, the reciprocal gives us the same value, okay? Because one is its own reciprocal, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to carry this forward. Uh, not going to re-investigate the proof at all. We're going to carry it forward into a couple of other results and then see how we can use it. Okay. Uh, we'll look at some theoretical stuff and some more practical stuff. So this is already in a box. You can put a big colorful box around it. Let's extend it now. Okay. You remember that we began looking at that circle and there was the sector inside it, there was the triangle inside it, and then there was that triangle outside it which did not have to do with side theta and theta, it had to do with tan theta and theta, right? So, it stands to reason that I should be able to bring this in in a little way, okay? So, for me, the best way to bring tan into play here is to use this as my first line. So, if I think about that limit, I can say, well, as theta approaches zero, for small values of theta, Side theta is very close to tan, isn't it? I mean, the only difference between side and tan is, what is the difference between side and tan? Dividing cos. It's divided by cos, right? So therefore, I can rewrite sine as tan times cos. Do you agree with that? Like that's sine theta and cos theta times cos theta. They should cancel out and give you back sine. So I am rewriting side theta in that form. Now, keep in mind, because this is exactly the same as this, just rejigged a little bit, it's still equal to the same value. Yes? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Take this with me, though, because if you think all the way back to when we first introduced limits, and I know this is a while ago, so if you forgot this, that's okay, you might remember that when you've got a product of two limits, right? and that's what this is, this is the limit as theta approaches zero of this, times this, that the limit of a product is in fact the product of two limits. You can treat them quite separately. This is different to derivatives. Limits are, limits are their own thing, right? So this is the limit as theta approaches zero of this ratio times a whole new limit over here, right? Treating the cosine on its own terms. But of course, this we kind of took advantage of this trick before. This is wonderful because this right hand bit here, this is really simple, isn't it? What is happening to cosine as theta pinches zero? Where's it going? It's coming up to one, right? Think of what the cosine graph looks like. There it is, right? It's an even function. So this guy is just going to be equal to one. Just that guy over there. By the way, I would like to encourage you, whenever you're using these limits, or if you do a limit like this, Please, even though multiplying by 1 doesn't change something, please indicate to me that you are multiplying by 1, right? It's a difference between um, a term disappearing and a term becoming something that will then end up disappearing once I evaluate it, okay? This is me showing I understand what's happening to this limit. It's not that I ignore it, it's that it's something, and that that's something factors in, okay? Now, remember we said that this guy was just a rewriting of this, so when I evaluate it, because I can evaluate it, it's just equal to the left hand side. It's just equal to one. Like that. <laughs> so this tells me now, bringing it all together, because now I've got 10 theta and theta by themselves, I'll put this in a box, that the limit as theta approaches zero of not just sine theta on theta, but tan theta on theta, also equal to one. And that means because, again, <laughs> one is its own reciprocal, I can turn this upside down. Yep. Why is the left hand side one? Why is the left hand side one? Great question. See where this left hand side came from, right? Where it really came from was me rewriting this to try and squeeze tan out of it, right? So sine is tan times cos. So this whole thing here is exactly the same as this whole thing here, which is one. Okay. Glad you clarified that. Yep. Sorry, um, why did the... Cos theta on theta become cos 
Okay, so you can see here, right? All I've done here is just tease out the cos theta, show you you're actually oh. dealing with something times something else. Oh. And from this line to oh. this line, the limit of a product is the product of the limits. Yeah. Okay. 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 Fantastic. So now I've got this, I can turn it upside down just in the same way that I did here. So the limit as theta approaches zero of the reciprocal also equal to one. And let's put a big box around it. Okay, excellent. Now, this is very, very theoretical, right? What you're doing is you're comparing these things together and you're saying, look, when theta is really tiny, when you're getting close to the origin, these things are going to get closer and closer and closer to each other, okay? So draw for me just a little picture of this. If we draw the first quadrant and we draw sine theta, theta, and tan theta. Okay, this is what they're all going to look like. Um, I can do three colors. I think I've got the colors. I'm really interested in small values of theta, so I'm not even go, going to go past pi on two, uh, thinking in radians mode. Because remember, the original geometric construction that we did this on, I had to have acute angles, right? So how far does sine theta go? It starts at the origin. What does it get to by the time it gets to theta equals pi on two? It gets up to... One, and then it stops there, right? So I'm just gonna draw that little part of sine theta. So there is um, an end there, that's sine theta. Now, what does tan theta look like? Tan theta. Um, it's got this asymptote of pi on two, doesn't it? It can't get there. It gets steeper and steeper and steeper. So if I put it on the same graph, it's gonna look something like that. How do you know it doesn't go on? Say that again. How do you know that it doesn't go on? Ah, that's a great question. How do we know that it cannot and will not ever in this domain go underneath? Think, think back. Yeah. Well, um, tangent keeps going up. And also, concave. Concave. Yep, we're talking about concavity. Yep. And then it started one is the ratio of the theta. Yes, good. Okay, so let's just rehearse that for a second in case you didn't catch it, right? They're both doing the same kind of behavior. They're both approaching, and I'm actually missing something here. The line in between is theta, and it's a straight line. Okay. So there is uh, theta, there's tan theta, and there's sine theta. Okay. So you've got this guy, which is just no concavity. This one is concave up, so that's why it curves away. Oops. And this is concave down, so it also curves away, but in the other direction. There's another way to see it, and you may need to just turn back to yesterday's work. Before we got to this, there was an inequality that preceded this. Do you remember what the inequality was? It had three pieces to it. Remember? I think, if we get it right, it should be sine theta is less than theta, theta which is less than tan theta. Do you remember what these represented? They represented a triangle inside a circle, the sector, and the triangle that went outside the circle. And look at this. When theta is acute, you can't break this, right? So that means this is always underneath, and this is always in the middle, and that is always above. That's exactly what that inequality tells us, okay? Brilliant. So, let's use this before we move on to some more like application applications. Let's look at a pretty algebraic application. So we've got three, three of these for 